So we'll go ahead um, and get started, everyone. So welcome, everyone, to the, uh, the Canadian Cancer Survival Research um, Consortium webinar series. And we're really lucky today to have Jennifer Burnett uh, presenting to us. Um, the title of her talk is Understanding and Enhancing Body Image After Cancer. And uh, Jennifer is an assistant professor in the School of Human Genetics at the University of Ottawa and also an affiliated investigator with the Cancer Therapeutics Program at Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Um, she's also been the recipient of a Canadian Cancer Society uh, Career Award in Prevention. Uh, she works collaborat collaboratively on different research projects, primarily focused on understanding the psychological and social influences on um, physical activity behavior and the consequences of that, as well as trying to identify and understand the psychological and social factors that may influence people's physical activity, motivation, and behavior in order to inform intervention. Um, so we'll let uh, uh, Jennifer take it away here, and if you have questions um, afterwards, we'll be unmuting the line, and you can ask those questions, or you can use it for, via the chat uh, window down below by typing your question. Um, Jennifer, are you uh, ready to take, on, take it over? Yes, I am. So All first, right. uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to today's webinar presentation that's focused on body image and breast cancer. Um, so my presentation today is more meant for people who are not necessarily body image researchers, uh, but hopefully if you're, some of you here are experienced body image researchers, which I see from the list of participants there are, hopefully you'll still be able to learn something here. So um, really what I'm going to try to do is to make you aware of some of the, the basic ideas of body image and breast cancer so that you can start thinking about whether or not body image fits within either your research program or your clinical practice. Uh, before I begin, though, I'd like to read to you two quotes from women who are diagnosed by breast cancer. Um, they come from a qualitative study where women, um, women recounted their experiences with uh, their bodies following treatment for breast cancer. So the first quote, it's a bit long, but bear with me because it really captures well some of the reasons why we should pay closer attention to body image in breast cancer research and clinical practice. So here I go. So my self-image initially was wonderful. I felt really good about myself despite the fact that I had breast cancer. And that kind of good feeling carried me through a lot of the initial shock. I guess after a while, those kind of good feelings dissipated as I got farther and farther into the process. My feelings sort of started to change after the whole post-surgery, post-radiation, because then my focus changed off of breast cancer. My focus really wasn't on breast cancer anymore because then I was supposed to all of a sudden slide back into my normal life. And then I would say my self-image started to change. I started taking the tamoxifen, which seriously contributed to a change in my self-image. Like, the biggest thing of all is that all of a sudden my body wasn't mine. It was hijacked by this little white pill I had to take every day. And I knew that if I didn't take it, my chances of survival were decreased. But if I do take it, then my chances of symptoms and a whole raft of side effects are going to ensue. So really, my heart wasn't into it, and my body, my body became hijacked. I went from being premenopausal because I was 50 to having hot flashes, mood swings, and, and complete insomnia, and that weared me down emotionally. And it had a physical effect because I really wasn't rested and I always felt like I was battling. I mean, it's just disturbing. And then, of course, the weight gain. I'd been very specific with my oncologist that if I gain any weight, I'm going to kill myself. This isn't going to happen to me. I won't let it happen to me. But I had no control of it. As time went on, I kept on putting on weight even though I was trying not to. Now, I'm really debating whether or not I should continue taking this tamoxifen. So this quote really provides an example of how breast cancer and its treatments can profoundly affect women's body image and really create some major challenges that they need to address as they're supposed to regain their normal life. On the other hand, though, it's not always all negative. I've provided a much shorter quote here that shows you that body acceptance is also possible post-diagnosis despite perceiving some perfections. So another woman recounted that, now I would say that I have a pretty good body, pretty good shape, a lot of battle scars, stretch marks, and incisions, but I still accept them. I'll take them for what they are, and I'll be proud to say that I made it through one more battle. But 
That said, I think if anybody ever offered me to have plastic surgery or cosmetic procedures, what would I say? I'd say give me a tuck because since getting cancer, I've put on a lot of weight around my waist. So I like both these quotes because they really show that there are positive and negative facets that occur post breast cancer, and really um, they force us to think of the concept of body image more in a holistic way, not just pathology focused. So here's a review of my presentation that I'll be giving today. I'll start by explaining how breast cancer can be influenced by body image. Then I'll talk to you about what body image is and show you a few theories that have been developed to study body image in the cancer context. Then one of my main goals is really to inform you about existing research on body image in breast cancer and discuss possible interventions for improving body image in this population. I'll end the presentation by introducing the concept of body, positive body image and argue that it's an important concept to study just as much as negative body image. Breast cancer is the leading form of cancer diagnosed in women. One in nine Canadian women will be likely diagnosed during their lifetime. Fortunately, we know that early detection and improved treatments have led to an increase in survival rates, with more than 88% of women surviving the disease at least five years. As you all likely know, the available treatments can result in a number of short and long-term negative physical and psychosocial side effects um, that negatively impact women. In terms of the physical effects, women experience a loss of functioning, decreased range of motion, pain, nausea, fatigue, um, and a number of other negative consequences such as weight gain, hot flashes, which was mentioned in the opening quote. In terms of the psychosocial effects, women can experience depression, anxiety, stress, a loss of sense of control, social isolation, and overall a decreased subjective well-being. As a result, the successful treatment should mean not only that we should try to help women survive the disease, but it should also mean that we should assist women in achieving and enhancing their quality of life. For this reason, in the last decade, especially in psychosocial oncology, quality of life has become a primary endpoint in our research and clinical practice. And quality of life is a really complex con concept that encompasses many different dimensions, but one of these dimensions is body image research, uh, is body image, that is. Researchers have documented that breast cancer, surgical treatments, and a therapies may result in major alterations of body image through the visible changes such as the loss of a breast, disfigurement, weight gain, muscle loss, scars, and so on. While many of these changes are of concern to women based on studies that exist, in our own research we found that changes in body composition and weight are of central importance. It's not all surprising to us though because nearly 80% of women in the general population report negative attitudes about their weight and body size dissatisfaction is a common struggle in women's life. One of the reasons why this may be is that um, women are taught that they're valued largely because of their appearance and they recognize that the way their bodies look bears greatly on how people relate to them and is directly connected to their economic value in society. Another reason is that they tend to internalize weight-based stereotypes that hold that people are personally responsible for their weight. And so if a person is overweight, it's because they're not putting effort into it. And therefore, they may feel that weight gain is a matter of personal responsibility that denotes failure of their ability to control their weight. A final reason for this might be that women recognize that overweight and obese women in Western society are often perceived as unattractive, undesirable, and unhealthy, and don't want to be perceived as such. There's actually evidence suggesting this. Another way for breast cancer to influence body image is through the invisible changes, though, such as pain, numbness, fatigue, and sexual dysfunction. 
In other words, the physical changes don't have to be readily apparent to others to alter women's body image. This is because body image doesn't just represent uh, a person's view of themselves, of their outer body, it also represents bodily sensations and personal and social expectations of what a person should be able to do. So if some of the non-visible changes impose physical limitations, this may negatively impact women's perceptions and beliefs about their strengths and weaknesses, as well as other people's perceptions of them. So for example, a woman prior to being diagnosed with breast cancer may view herself as a physically strong woman who's capable of taking care of four children and doing everything in the household, but now views herself as weak because she's always tired and unable to fulfill her daily chores. This can then influence how she thinks, acts, and feels towards her body. So with this in mind, it's important to remember that women's body image is associated with more than just cosmetic or appearance concerns. It's also influenced by their physical status and their social interactions. Another thing to note is that the degree of physical change is not always proportional to the effect that it can have on women, and I can't emphasize this enough. So sometimes we may see minor changes as being trivial, but for some women these are actually quite catastrophic, whereas other major changes may be less catastrophic to these women. So this really highlights the importance that body image is, an, is individually determined. So although the construct of body image has received growing attention in the cancer literature in the last few decades, there remain several noteworthy limitations. I'd have to say that one of the biggest limitations pertains to its conceptualizations. It really is about more than just how women view themselves. It's a reflection of women's subjective bodily experiences. And I'll show you a bit more about the complexity of this construct in the next slide. So just a quick search of articles on body image and breast cancer will reveal to you that there are at least 15 different expressions that are used as synonyms of body image and they're used interchangeably. So for example, you'll find weight satisfaction, size perception accuracy, body satisfaction, appearance satisfaction, body esteem, body image disturbance, and I can go on for even longer. The use of these different terms is problematic when we want to start to compare findings across study or start to synthesize the data to see to what extent body image is truly a problem in this population. To address this issue, many researchers have actually tried to define body image, but so far there's no comprehensive definition of body image in the field of psychosocial oncology, and so it remains defined in many different ways across studies. That said, many would agree, though, that body image requires that researchers and clinicians adopt a multidimensional perspective to capture people's subjective experiences. And if we take all the different definitions that are out there in the literature, we can argue that body image relates to how you picture yourself in your mind, what you believe of your own appearance, how you feel about your body, how you sense and control your body as you move, and how you feel in your body, not just about your body. So all of these facets can either be positive or negative. So when a person has a negative body image, it would mean that they have a distorted perception of their body's shape, that is the perception that their body parts are either bigger or smaller than they actually are. They're convinced that only other people are attractive and that their own body size or shape is a sign of personal failure, that their body doesn't measure up to social ideals, they feel ashamed, self-conscious, or anxious about their body, they feel uncomfortable or awkward in their body, and they have constant negative thoughts about their body and constantly compare them to others. The different characteristics that I just mentioned to you on the other slides, or the different questions, I should say, um, have been grouped together into different dimensions of body image established by cash um, that are generally accepted in the 
psychology literature, and more and more they're coming into the cancer literature. So specifically, Cash established that body image consists of four different dimensions. The first he labeled um, perceptual and this reflects how you see yourself in the mirror or imagine yourself. The second he labeled cognitive and this reflects what you think when you evaluate your body in terms of its appearance and function. Some have also labeled this as attitudinal though but it means the same thing. So you'd get at this aspect by asking women to report the level of satisfaction or dissatisfaction they have with their bodies. The third dimension is labeled affective, and this reflects feelings that people have in relation to their body's appearance and function. So essentially, you would find out if women are feeling shame, guilt, anxiety, disgust, pride towards their bodies. The final dimension they labeled is behavioral, and this reflects things that people do that reflect their perceptions, their thoughts, and their feelings about, your body, about their body. So you can get at this by asking women to report any behaviors such as avoidance of social situations where their body is exposed, or any dieting or physical activity that they're doing to try to manage their weight or their appearance. In spite of the notion that body image is multidimensional and the fact that it, this conceptualization exists, many researchers and clinicians working with breast cancer survivors have not widely adopted it. Most have only focused on one of its specific dimensions at a time, mostly the cognitive aspect or the perceptual aspect. And this really doesn't allow us to have a comprehensive understanding of body image issues in this population. So moving forward, one of the key issues will, will really be to adopt a multidimensional perspective in future research and clinical practice. Since the year 2000, because it's only been relatively recent, there have been a few theoretical models that have been proposed in the literature specifically for individuals with cancer. So I'll present three of them here. I'm gonna present the ones, they're not necessarily the, the best or, or anything like that, but it's because they've been developed specifically for cancer uh, patients or patients with chronic illnesses. So the first one was developed by the Appearance Research Collaboration, which is a network composed of academics and practitioners. So within this framework, the processes of adjustment to disfiguring conditions, such as breast cancer, is believed to be affected by three different facets. The first is a person's social and psychological context. So this consists of predisposing factors, such as demographic characteristics, the social cultural settings within which they're exposed and their family environment. Uh, the ARC, however, acknowledges that these are really difficult to change through interventions. And so in their model, they actually place greater emphasis on the cognitive and behavioral processes that are most closely related to the appearance cognitions. Um, hence why they're closer to appearance cognitions in the line of, um, categories presented there. So the second facet of the model compromises um, the cognitive processes that influence adjustment. It's believed that when appearance is more salient to a person, so it's more important that it's negative and that a person thinks that their body is further from their ideal, um, adjustment will be poorer. And then the last facet of the model is the observable and experienced effects of appearance Parents' concerns such as social anxiety, avoidance, and shame that a person may feel towards their body. That said, though, the authors do acknowledge that these constructs, although presented as outcomes, can also actually inform cognitions and body image. As such, while they present their model in a linear fashion, they actually suggest that it might be dynamic and more cyclical. While this framework does indeed discuss some of the factors that may be associated with body image, I'd like to note here that it hasn't actually been tested in empirical studies with breast cancer survivors. So it's been developed to use with them, but it hasn't been tested. 
So we'll need future research to see whether or not it's actually useful for understanding body image in this population and if it can actually be used to develop interventions to promote body image. The second model here is um, a bit busy. Um, it's the heuristic cognitive model of body image, and it was developed by White. Um, some of you might actually be more familiar with it if you've read about body image studies in cancer because it's often cited. It's rooted in the general uh, principles of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, as the title suggests, as well as self-discrepancy theory, though. <laughs> So based on this model, cancer can activate a person's appearance-related schema, that is, their pattern of thought about their body, and this in turn will influence their investment in their appearance and self-evaluation. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Uh, in turn, people may experience negative appearance but it assumptions, beliefs, and feelings towards themselves, and then in turn engage in behaviors to try to improve their appearance. In comparison to other theories of, or models of body image, this particular model actually places greater emphasis on appearance investment, which is neglected in other models. So it really is an important strength of the model. Despite this, and the fact that this model can actually serve as a sound theoretical framework to comprehensively understand breast cancer survivors' body-related experiences, many researchers in the oncology field have actually taken a more atheoretical approach to study body image, and thus, just as the previous model, the usefulness of this model remains largely untested, or the theoretical hypotheses still need to be tested. The last model I'll present to you is the continuum of body image, um, which was developed by Fingeret. They, she conceptualized body image concerns um, to lie on a continuum, which inherently suggests that a person can range from either having no body image concerns to um, having extreme body concerns. So we can discuss whether or not this is an appropriate way, but um, this is what the model suggests. It suggests that you can actually distinguish treatment considerations and behavioral outcomes depending on where a person falls along this continuum. So it, it tends to focus more on the consequences of body image, less on the antecedents of body image, uh, whereas the other two did. So for example, if we look at the continuum, we can see that patients who ha would have mild to moderate difficulties adjusting to body image changes may actually engage in social situations even though they feel somewhat self-conscious, so it doesn't necessarily impact um, their social behavior or even their psychological well-being. In contrast, though, those with extreme body image concerns would likely avoid those social situations nearly all together and become isolated and have their psychological well-being negatively impacted. Again, I feel like I'm a broken record here, but um, just as the two other models, this model has not been empirically tested, and so we really need to test the tenability of a body image continuum in this, in this area. In fact, it's disappointing to say, but really um, theory is rarely tied into existing body image research, and as well, it really takes away from the richness of our understanding of body image. Um, so we, we need to integrate more theory into our research. So in the last few years, um, there's been increasing attention being given to the subject of body image among breast cancer survivors. Um, so what I'll do in the next few slides is provide an overview of the findings from existing studies on body image and breast cancer. What I've done um, is categorize the findings based on the research questions addressed. So the first set of studies that exist are the studies that aim to describe the extent of the problem where researchers have tried to provide rates of body dissatisfaction or body image concerns. So in general, these studies provide evidence that a considerable number of breast cancer survivors do indeed experience breast, uh, body image concerns. 
So for example, one study found that over 50% of women reported concerns or embarrassment about one or more types of body changes at some point following diagnosis. In another study, Fulbert and colleagues surveyed young women who were diagnosed with breast cancer less than seven months prior and found that 17 to 33% of women experienced body image concerns at some or much of the time. Others have also conducted studies with longer-term breast cancer survivors and showed that 15 to 50 percent experienced some degree of body image concern that impacted their quality of life. So really, if we take these findings together, it suggests that body image concerns do affect a substantial number of breast cancer survivors. Within the same body of literature, it's important to know, though, that most of the studies are cross-sectional, so it really doesn't allow us to see changes over time. Um, some, however, have tried to compare levels of body image by sampling women who had recently been treated with women who had completed treatment several years prior, usually five years or more. Um, so, for instance, Fulbert and colleagues showed that women were most concerned about body image in the immediate post-operative period and soon after completing other forms in treatment, then further along the cancer uh, trajectory. However, others have not been able to actually support these findings. They found no differences uh, regardless of women, where women were at um, in their cancer trajectory. There are a few recent longitudinal studies that are starting to emerge which follow women post-diagnosis or treatment, but again, the findings are mixed too. So we really don't know whether or not body image remains stable, does it increase, does it decrease over time, and there may actually be heterogeneity in the pattern. Some women may remain stable and some they may find coping strategies or get interventions and it increases. So we really need to see how these change to, to identify if there are a subgroup of women for whom it worsens and needs specific interventions. The next set of studies on body image and breast cancer have been conducted to identify predictors of body image. So just like the research on prevalence of body image, though research on factors that influence body image um, in breast cancer survivors is underdeveloped, we can make a few conclusions because some of the studies have focused on um, tr the role of treatment and length of time since treatment. So in regards to the type of treatment, um, there's no consensus actually on whether the type of surgery received is related to body image surgery. So for example, Gantz and colleagues found that women receiving a mastectomy reported lower scores on body image compared with women receiving breast conserving surgery, but in contrast, Fobe and others did not find that type of surgery to be a relevant factor in predicting satisfaction with body image. Further, uh, previous studies is all, are also inconsistent in regards to adjuvant therapy. While more studies show that chemotherapy, hormone therapy, and radiation therapy do negatively affect body image, there are a few studies that show that whether or not women receive chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and hormone therapy does not impact their body image. Um, another relevant factor is the length of time, as I mentioned just before. But again, um, there's no consistent findings on that. Some studies have shown that women in the immediate period of diagnosis have worse body image, whereas other studies have shown that it's actually not all that bad. It gets worse over time because uh, women's priorities focus, uh, shift over time. There's also some evidence to suggest that more favorable body image is observed in women who undergo reconstruction specifically um, immediate reconstruction as compared to delayed reconstruction. And then last, there's demographic characteristics that have been associated with body image. So in general, um, body image seems to vary with age, marital status, and educational level. With younger women, women who are married, um, 
reporting lower levels of body image as well as women who have a lower educational level. And then there are some studies that have looked at the links between weight status and body image in this population and shown that women with a higher body mass index, so indicative of being overweight or obese, are more likely to experience body image concerns. So while these studies are really informative, this research on other types of predictors, predictors that are modifiable or amenable to change and in intervention, is really scarce, and so um, ident these findings are important so that we can identify women who are more likely to experience body image concerns, but it really doesn't give us an indication of what we should be targeting in our interventions. So clearly, we need to do more research on psychological and cognitive variables that may be predictive of body image. The last set of studies that I'll present are those that have examined outcomes of body image. So across a number of studies, body image has significantly been related to a wide range of negative outcomes that can be divided into psychological, social, and behavioral, behavioral categories. So in regards to the psychological consequences, studies with breast cancer have shown that body image concerns are significantly correlated with higher levels of anxiety, depression, worse quality of life, adjustment difficulties, general emotional distress, and lack of confidence. So these really provide evidence for the detrimental psychological health effects of body image, which underscores the importance of enhancing body image, uh, body image in this population. While the issues of whether or not body image affects Social outcomes is complex because there's many other variables involved, such as a person's personality or desire to interact with others and things like that. The findings are generally consistent that body image negatively impacts women's sense of self and the degree of confidence in social situations. So specifically, there are studies that show that women are hesitant about establishing new relationships or maintaining current ones due to insecurities about the way they look or feel um, because if they feel unattractive, they may not want to initiate conversations with strangers. Studies also tell us that women's friendships and intimate romantic relationships are negatively effect affected, which can leave them feeling isolated. In addition to the psychological and social consequences of body image, there's a range of behavioral consequences. And this is because surgical and adjuvant therapy um, may cause body image alterations. Some women may actually ponder which type of treatment they want to do because of this. Um, so for example, women may opt for a lumpectomy over a mastectomy um, if they're concerned about their body image. As well, it can influence women's adherence to treatment regimens. There's actually been a recent study showing that body image accounts for 14% of the variance in women's treatment adherence, which is quite considerable. Another important behavioral outcome that's influenced by body image is participation in health behaviors, such as physical activity. So traditionally, the emphasis has been on understanding if physical activity can actually improve body image, but there's evidence for a reciprocal relationship. So specifically, we've found in our own studies um, that body image can actually act as a barrier to physical activity. So um, this is because it may lead people to feel like they need to exercise in physical activity out of shame or guilt or um, to impress other people. And this type of motivation is often associated with lower levels of physical activity over time. I've also seen in one of my PhD studies that a body image concerns may lead to avoidance in physical activity because people want to avoid the places that exasperate um, their body concerns. And physical activity environments often put women's bodies on display. So for this reason, they avoid it, even though they, they most often tell us that they know it's good for them and can help them manage their weight or other appearance concerns. 
In addition to the negative impact that body image can have on physical activity, other co common coping strategies women can use to deal with body image include smoking, dieting, taking weight loss pills, all of which can severely compromise their health. In a study that I'm currently conducting, one woman mentioned to me that she started smoking again because she knew, because of in the past, that it helped her to manage her weight. Another woman said that she was taking weight loss pills but hadn't told her doctor because she was afraid of his reaction. So these are not necessarily surprising behaviors because there are often coping strategies widely promoted in the media but I think we can all agree here that they can have dangerous consequences if brought to the extreme. So these risks, combined with the other negative outcomes that I mentioned on the previous slide, really emphasize the importance of trying to reduce body image concerns among breast cancer survivors. So as a starting point to do this, we need to first start to assess body image um, concerns more readily in practice. Um, this can simply be by asking open-ended questions to individuals, even though they don't proactively bring it up. Um, it's also important to do so at different points in the cancer trajectory because some concerns uh, may be brought on early on that interfere with treatment, but other body image concerns can become more evident following treatment. So, for example, uh, a woman may avoid viewing herself in the mirror after uh, surgery or refuse to allow her husband to view her breast. So, if we don't assess body image, it's going to be left unrecognized and untreated, and then women with debilitating body image concerns may ultimately become reclusive and be unable to resume routine activities. So considering the multifaceted nature of body image, there's a few indicators just in general that can be brought up in practice that may suggest that women have dysfunctional thoughts, maladaptive behaviors, and negative emotions towards their body that will either potentially interfere with their treatment or lead to negative psychological, social, and behavioral comp consequences. So, for example, if women raise that they have difficulty making treatment decisions because of the anticipated or feared negative physical changes, that might be an indication. If they're avoiding social situations because of their concerns about their body, if they're reporting a high degree of dissatisfaction with their body, or if they have a distorted perception of the way their bodies look, they're telling you that they're overweight, but they're clearly not. This may indicate body image concerns which need to be addressed. Whoop. It's hard to say within clinical practice um, how to go about assessing and addressing body image concerns. I'm aware of actually only one study by Cohen and colleagues in 2012 which focuses on uh, patient-physician communication about body image changes related to cancer. But just recently, um, in 2012, Finger It recognized this um, and proposed proposed a framework for addressing body image concerns in practice, which um, she labeled the three Cs. So this work started in 2010, hence the reference there, but actually was published in 2014. So this strategy encourages patients to discuss their body image concerns, thereby allowing clinicians to identify emotional difficulties and problematic behaviors associated with these concerns, and then develop a plan to address them. So at the beginning of the clinical encounter, clinicians, they remind patients that body image difficulties are very common as a result of cancer and its treatments. And this normalizing process is a way to reduce shame, embarrassment, and stigma that women may have. They should then ask patients um, what specific concerns they have to try to be able to identify which type of intervention they need. Um, and these may include concerns about the effect of impending treatment or about recent or prolonged changes to appearance and functioning. 
And then um, finally, they should ask patients about the consequences of their body image difficulties or the impact that it has on their daily functioning. In addition to the three Cs, Fingrit makes four additional recommendations uh, for clinicians to effectively address body image issues in practice. So these include educating patients about what to expect in terms of appearance and functional outcomes as a result of the treatments, to connect patients with relevant community resources, to refer patients to a mental health specialist for brief or intensive therapy if needed, and then follow up with patients to know whether or not body image issues um, have been addressed or have been diminished over time. So while this approach may be um, idyllic in a clinical practice, um, in re for research purposes, it's not always ideal, especially when we're doing large-scale studies. So another approach to assessing body image um, that may be more feasible or appropriate is using questionnaires. Um, so there's several questionnaires that have been developed to assess body image in general, but there's only a handful that have actually been developed for cancer survivors. So in picking which questionnaire, three questions I would recommend people to think about is first, does it assess the multidimensional nature of body image? So if the particular one doesn't, it may require um, to pick a combination of measures that would allow for this. Second, at what time point would the questionnaire be assessed? Um, administered to women. So some questionnaires include items that ask women to reflect on if issues um, regarding surgery or treatment. So these may be less relevant for women who are actually awaiting surgery or treatment. And then last, whether or not comparisons will be made with women without a history of breast cancer um, or other groups. Because if this is the case, using disease-specific assessments might be irrelevant um, as women without a history of breast cancer would find some of the items um, not applicable to them. So I want just to go back to my first point, and then I won't belabor on this because I've presented this before, but in picking a measure, um, it's important to pick a measure that assesses women's level of accuracy about their judgment, um, so their, their perceptual body image, the degree of satisfaction or dissatisfaction with their body shape, the feelings that they experience towards their body, as well as um, the behavioral components of body image. So what types of behaviors are they engaging in to divert attention away from themselves, such as wearing baggy clothes or avoiding situations, or yet again, lifestyle behaviors that they're engaging in to change their physical appearance, such as physical activity, dieting, uh, taking diet pills, and so on. For this to happen, though, um, I feel like there's going to be a, a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of the measurement of body image in breast cancer. Um, and I say this because of the conclusions from a recent review on body image in, uh, measures that was published in 2012 in support of cancer care. So the authors identified six measures that are appropriate for cancer survivors, four of which um, were specifically designed for breast cancer survivors. And they made several conclusions. So one conclusion that they made is that there's obviously a limited number of tools. Uh, the second conclusion is that some of the reported psychometrics may seem promising, but none have actually undergone a complete validation process to say that there, they, that measure should be the gold standard of body image in breast cancer. They also mentioned that different methods were used to develop the items for the questionnaires, and in several cases, it was solely based on expert opinion and literature reviews, neglecting women's input. So to make sure that these measures really capture women's experiences, we need to focus on developing questionnaires that ask women for their input um, so that we can holistically measure body image in a relevant way. 
So because of the number of limited tools, it was actually quite easy to put together this slide. Um, there's not so many items there, but here's a list of questionnaires that have been mostly used with patients in cancer. They range considerably in the number of items and hence the length of time to complete, but most of them are unidimensional or only include one or two, uh, two or three subscales assessing body image, and they're often clumped in with quality of life or sexual um, dysfunction items. So that's something to be wary about. And while the last um, questionnaire there, I put it in italics. It's not necessarily a questionnaire that was developed for patients with cancer, but it is one of the most widely used ones in the general population. And also Dr. Saviston, myself and others, we've recently tested its validity in a sample of breast cancer survivors and confirmed that it can be used to compare women with and without a history with breast cancer with the exception of one of its subscales. We find that this is a good measure and suggest that we might want to use it as a starting point in our research because it's one of the most comprehensive measures available to assess body image. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk to you about some of the interventions that are out there to promote uh, body image. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly because I see that I'm running out of time, but um, hopefully I'll be able to get through this. So preliminary evidence supports that educational interventions for addressing body image are promising. Um, and one of the biggest uh, randomized control interventions, Helga Sin um, gave guest lectures for women about the side effects that were going to come about for um, breast cancer treatments. And can, they found consistent positive effects on body image and self-esteem in the education group compared to a group that was a control group and an education plus peer discussion group. So quite promising, but again, we need um, more evidence on this because there's actually been few intervention trials testing its effectiveness. Cosmetic focus interventions, they focus on improving body image um, by either teaching women how to use beauty, treat, um, beauty products or by actually providing women with specific beauty treatments. And there's initial support for these types of interventions. So for instance, Quintard and Ladia randomized women to beauty treatment or routine cancer care um, intervention during the first week post-surgery, and they found that women who were randomized to the beauty treatment condition um, had better body image scores than the control group three months after surgery. With regards to psychological interventions tested, there exists many, um, but one of the most common ones is cognitive behavior therapy, so CBT for short. Um, it's a goal-oriented psychotherapeutic approach delivered by a trained mental health professional that targets uh, people's dysfunctional thoughts, emotions, and behaviors through techniques which include goal setting, cognitive restructuring, and systematic desensitization, and skills training. So it's been established and empirically validated for treatment uh, for body image. Um, and all the studies that I can find that looked at cognitive behavioral therapy to improve body image showed improvements in body image over time. And impressively, for the studies that conducted follow-up assessments post-intervention, uh, improvements in body image outcomes were maintained six and 12 months after completion of the intervention. With regards to the behavioral interventions, researchers have evaluated the effectiveness of physical activity and consistent with approaches to improving women's global mental health, physical activity certainly appears to be an effective strategy to promote body image in breast cancer survivors, whether it be aerobic, strength, yoga um, training, but we, we don't really know at this point in time which mode of physical activity or which intensity of physical activity um, is most beneficial. So we'll need a bit more research on that. So 
I think I'm going to end on this slide rather than try to get through everything else that I had, but what I'd like to do here is just re-highlight some of the limitations of the research for body image and breast cancer and show you that it's not necessarily to criticize the research that's out there, but rather it can serve as a starting point for future research. So, because um, the studies that are out there, they're interesting and they're informative, um, but we do certainly need more theoretically based modifiable factor studies that can, so that we know which factors to target in our interventions to try to promote um, body image in this population. Um, also, because of the lack of longitudinal studies specifically designed to evaluate the evolution of body image over the course of the disease, we need more large-scale longitudinal studies that track body image over time to see at what point does body image become critically important or worsen in this, um, in this population. Also, the fact that most researchers have not conceptualized body image as a multidimensional construct because they've only focused on one of its specific dimensions suggests we need to push for a more comprehensive assessment of this construct and thus undertake measurement type studies. Additionally, the number and scope of intervention studies are really, really insufficient at this point in time to inform clinical uh, practice. So we need to provide more evidence so for which type of interventions or combinations of interventions can be easily implemented into clinical practice. And last, um, I think we need to start moving away from the traditional focus on pathology, so that is negative body image, and really put an emphasis on learning about growth and positive body image, um, which I would have liked to discuss with you today, but I think I've run out of time and I just wanted to leave a bit of time for anybody who had any questions. So uh, you'll, you, you have the rest of my slides. If ever you have any questions on them, feel free to email me, but uh, I think at this point we're allowed to open up the floor for questions or unmute and, uh, and that, so thank you.